So my name is Nancy Cox. I'm a quantitative human geneticist. And um, so I am going to talk about uh, pleiotropy um, and some of the things that we do in our biobank. But um, I wanted to start out by also saying I, all of my success in science is because I got into computing very early. And I know many of you um, are into computing and modeling. And one of the things that I had to learn the hard way with one of my with a postdoctoral advisor was thinking through how to how to spend my time on things that were worth spending my time on. So there's so many fun and interesting things you can do when you can make a computer do anything you want. And um, I used to go into his office with all the latest things I'd done and. I'd be so excited about it. I got, and I found this, and I got this, and, and he'd, he'd be nodding the whole time while he was eating, eating his peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and, and I'd say, yeah, I can see why, you, why that would be interesting. I, I can really see that. Tell me why you think it's important. And you know, after a few weeks of that, I was thinking through in advance why I thought it was important, so I'd have something to say. And of course, you know, he'd generally, gently destroy my thoughts on why it was very important. And so then I, I, I was trying to think ahead, you know, to what he'd think was important. And by the end of the postdoc, I had a little better idea of how to, how to think about the local questions you were trying to answer and how that illuminates sometimes bigger picture questions that lots of different kinds of people are interested in learning about. So when Peter talked, he said his favorite trait was height. Well, I don't think his favorite, his, he cares that much about height, but he's used height to illuminate human biology in completely new ways. I mean, uh, you know, sort of a life lesson for the world in how genetics works at scale. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do important science. And so the, the other title for my talk would be how to find fun and interesting science that's also important to work on. And I'm going to try to illustrate some things that I think are important to do and why I think they're important. So I come from the perspective of biobanking science. The, everybody knows what a biobank is. You have a bunch of people who have been um, sampled for some kinds of biological specimens, often blood, um, but sometimes urine and even biopsies of accessible tissues. Um, we usually nowadays have some level of omics uh, in such data. The phenotyping may have been collected over a couple of days of intake where people measure whatever is cheap and easy to measure. Um, a UK biobank model, the, um, some of the other biobanks have used, the, uh, the Canadian biobank is using that sort of idea. Um, but, but some biobanks have exclusively phenotypes through electronic health records. And I think that's more and more how genetics will be done in the future. As genetics becomes a part of medical care, it's free data. <laughs> I mean, anybody that has, that will give permission for their health information to be used for scientific research, when they have genetics data, and the electronic health record, it will change how we think about and certainly the numbers that we can do genetic science with. So in some ways, the biobanks with some access to electronic health records are a peek into the future of how we'll both make genetic discoveries and then also try to do the translational part of the research and finally also the, the actual clinical um, activities. The biobank at, at Vanderbilt, which um, Lisa really did a great job describing, is BioView. Um, and there's about 250,000 DNA samples um, with now about 120,000 with some level of genome interrogation, mostly cheap biobanking chips, but now more and more samples with exome or whole genome sequencing. We've in, imputed transcriptomes into all of the data, and now there's um, efforts by several young people to impute metabolomes in. Um, we're looking at how well we can do with methylome as well. And 
we have on average 10-ish to 15-ish years of electronic health records on subjects, but it's highly variable and there are some people who come to Vanderbilt just for their transplant and that's all the information we have on them or just to participate in a cancer clinical trial. But then there's a substantial fraction that get, for some period of time, all of their health care at Vanderbilt. And that includes people who are largely healthy and maybe work at Vanderbilt. And so you see people with six codes over 12 years, which is three normal pregnancies and three normal deliveries and whatever tests go with being pregnant. So that's not all sick people, but hugely overrepresenting rare diseases and really sick people because it's a tertiary medical center and people drive routinely drive five hours to come to Vanderbilt to be seen um, because they're you know it's the closest uh, big medical center for a whole catchment in the southeast the ranges from southern Indiana you know over into parts of Georgia Arkansas um, Alabama and Mississippi so it's a it's quite an interesting catchment and biobanks are an efficient way to do genetic studies right because you you have a whole bunch of phenotypes on the same set of people you can do the genetic interrogation and so you have an efficient design and and so you can use biobanks as Lisa noted for things like genome-wide association studies that we've been doing for you know the past um, now almost 15 years, where we're trying really hard to get through to understanding the mechanisms um, driving the genetic variation that we find associated with disease. And I would argue mm, that's actually not what biobanks are uniquely good at. It's not that they're, they're efficient at it, but um, it doesn't take full advantage of the structure of, of a biobank. I think. The, the thing that biobanks do uniquely well and that, you know, especially Tennessee, the recipe that we use in our still for the biobank, is to really start with interesting variants. Um, could be top GWAS signals, could be loss of function mutations in genes, could be these kinds of function rich omics, the, the imputed transcriptomes, imputed metabolomes, and get out phenome. And it's not just a GWAS turned on its head. You're asking fundamentally different questions. Um, and so I'm going to go through a little bit of how we impute the transcriptomes. There's some people here that are also interested in that. So we use, um, we use GTEx uh, as a reference panel. Now there may become some even larger data sets, but right now across many tissues, this is the largest sample set. And we, we basically use um, penalized regression approaches to build SNP-based predictors of gene expression. And the rationale for this is really that if we want to understand some of these traits, so think of the traits and diseases you know, here in the middle, and this sort of ring around the traits as what we measure as transcriptome. Some part of what we measure as the transcriptome is completely genetically determined. So there's genetic contributions to the variability in gene expression. Many gene expression, most gene expression traits are heritable to some degree, and, and that's what we're after. But of course, many other factors impact what we measure as gene expression. And we know, you know, we know some things about gene expression in tumors. Um, how aberrant that can actually be relative to um, normal tissue. So, yes, uh, somatic mutations, but then also whether you drink whether you drink coffee this morning. Coffee has caffeine, which is a potent drug. If we looked at transcriptomes from brains or livers, but even probably transcriptomes from blood, we could distinguish who had coffee this morning and who didn't. And and that, that's a good thing. It makes RNA-seq a really fantastic biomarker because it's very dynamic. Um, and so the dynamic part can be telling us really important things about health status and, and how, people, how healthy people are. But 
in terms of understanding causality, and I'm a geneticist, so what I want to know is how genetics impacts phenotypes, that's, that's precluding my ability. It's preventing my ability to draw conclusions because when we look at patients with diabetes and patients without, there are thousands of genes differentially expressed between cases and controls, mostly as a consequence of the deranged metabolism of the disease that people live with for years, the drugs they take to treat the disease, the, the lifestyle changes that, that end up being caused by the disease, the fact that they may have uh, more frequent infections, they may uh, even at, a, and at any given moment have gangrene and about to have a foot amputated. So there are all kinds of differences in measured expression that don't tell us anything about causality or the biology of diabetes or asthma or whatever we're looking at. And of course, that's partly, that's because there, there's a big trait altered component um, that feeds back from our diseases and traits onto what we measure. And so from the genetics perspective, I don't mind having a static probe into the biology of the transcriptome, a uh, pure genetic prediction on how that gene's variability might impact traits. And so we use this, the high quality, the genes with high quality prediction performance and test the association of this genetically determined regulation of gene expression um, with the fee codes that Lisa talked about and the cleaned lab values um, that we work on from the EHR. And and that creates a kind of a gene by medical phenome catalog that I'm pleased to say will start being publicly available this summer as soon as this manuscript gets accepted for publication. So we've got a, a portal ready to go. Um, and it's used by a faculty inside Vanderbilt now. So you can just look up for any gene, the medical phenome associated to that gene. Or you can look by phenotype too if you want. You can think of this as a gene-based phenome-wide association study. So Lisa talked about the, they always laugh when I say the traditional FIWAS because it's such a new technology, but the, the idea of use, looking at the function of a single variant in the context of the entire medical phenome. So this is trying to understand what a gene does in the context of the entire medical phenome. And more precisely, we're asking, what does the natural variation in the expression of this gene associate with across the medical phenome? Everybody got it? So the first problem I want to sell people looking for some fun things to do on is improving transcriptome prediction. Not that we do a bad job, but we don't do the best possible job. And part of the challenge is that the following two statements are both true. Most EQTLs are within 50 KB of the transcription start and stop sites of the genes that they regulate. But it's also true that the strongest EQTL for most genes or very close to most genes, 40 to 60 percent, that, that strongest EQTL is in no linkage disequilibrium, is far enough away but it is in no linkage disequilibrium at all with any of the variation of the gene. It's far, far away. And that leads to some interesting statistical challenges in developing the right kind of modeling that will work well for every situation. Um, I think uh, Noah alluded to a very cool paper out of Marcelo Nobrega's lab that we, we participated in where he showed that the, in some mouse studies, that the likely target of uh, a variance in the FTO gene that had been characterized as affecting obesity, an FTO, it's not well known, but the original, uh, the original word associated with FTO, it was an abbreviation for fatso. The mice were fat, um, and then, they also had fused toes, and they thought fatso was an inoffensive, an offensive 
um, descriptor word. So they called then FTO for fused toes in the mice. But this variation was not affecting the expression of FTO. It's affecting the expression of IRX3 and further down even IRX5, about 750 kb from where the variation associated with uh, BMI and obesity was. And um, this was <laughs> pretty controversial at first, in part because drug companies had already invested God knows how much money in studying the biology of FTO, thinking that they were going to get a big anti-obesity drug, and it wasn't even the right gene. So, so our basic problem is that we start with a gene that's got a lot of local variation that's associated with the expression of the gene. So we get local SNPs, often with fairly similar small effect sizes, um, that act pretty uniformly in any of the tissues or even, if you can get cell data, any of the cell types in which the gene's expressed. So there's some, some fairly commonly shared genetic architecture. Often the local genetic variation is more likely to be shared across all of the tissues in which a gene is expressed. For some genes, that's all we have. There, are, there don't seem to be any distantly acting enhancers. You have this, and when you have this, you're, all, of, all of our, so the, the models are fairly sparse. Transcriptomes are not polygenic um, at the level that we can look at them in cis, certainly. And so you're, you're better off with, you know, penalized regression approaches to give you, you know, these sparse models. And, and you're better off using a narrow window, right? But then we have some genes where we have these distantly acting, SNPs and distantly acting enhancers that have big effects. And when you have that, th those, that can be the largest effect on the expression of the gene. We'll often act with that very local variation but it's often the case that the SNPs in this distantly acting enhancer have effects in only a subset of the tissues, maybe only one, in which the gene's expressed. And so there's real biological difference often between how the local SNPs act and how these more distantly acting enhancers act in terms of the context effects of the genetic variation. And there's some genes where you have some tissues with this five prime enhancers um, that are having a big effect, you know, in two or three tissues, some in which only the local variation is affecting a bunch of tissues in which you just have that, and then a few other tissues in which you've got a completely different three prime enhancer that acts in a completely different way. And those three sets will be much less correlated with each other than they are inside. And, and this total distance that you'd need to include is big. And if you use that total big distance all, in all of the analyses for each gene, you're hurting yourself for the genes where you don't have that, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it's a, a very common problem in the context of, of predictive modeling. So we've been looking at several different uh, approaches. So in the PREDICT scan, the original approach, we didn't really use cross-tissue information. Every um, prediction model was built within a tissue uh, with elastic net, no, no incorporation of regulatory elements or expression similarity. Um, some work out of Hongyu uh, Zhao's lab at Yale, not really nice method, sparse group lasso taking, rec recognizing that um, there there'd be, might be some constraints on the betas, but allowing each tissue basically to have um, its own beta sort of, but constrained by knowing um, that there could be some shared architecture, um, but also not incorporating regulatory elements or expression similarity, sorry. I, I tried to fix most of them, but I couldn't, just couldn't fix all of them. And then um, the, we have another a new model that we're trying out, XT scan, using a weighted elastic net, where we're also including information on uh, regulatory elements and incorporating the information on expression similarity. So, for example, in GTEx, 
you have sun exposed skin and un non sun exposed skin both well they're both skin uh, and so there's a lot of similarities in the expressions of genes across those tissues in fact you know across many tissues uh, I'll show you that but th this work has been done by postdoc Dan Zhao in the lab there's a lot of um, shared uh, expression across tissues and in ways that make a lot of sense given the developmental ontologies of the tissues and the cell types making up those tissues and you can use that information to to provide a little bit um, better uh, performance on um, these kinds of predictive models similarly there's enough information in the DHS profile similarity to use that also and there's enough orthogonal information that it actually improves performance beyond just the tissue expression uh, similarity and so you get you know he's looked at the prediction performance and we can get some better performance with XT scan even than utmost and they're both a lot better than the original predict scan but but you know we're, we advisors are never satisfied and we're leaving a lot on the table, um, sort of even, so our, the, the biggest improvement is of course in the tissues where we have the least samples. So this is all tinkering at the margins. There's a lot of, of shared things we're picking up. This was actually with version six. It's not materially different with version eight, but the numbers are a lot bigger. We get a lot more genes with version eight because all the sample sizes have increased some even from version six. But I don't like leaving anything on the table. And so in the, so, and I'm in a hurry. <laughs> we want to get, you know, get this portal out with the best predictors we can for each gene. And so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to pick the best ones. But I think um, it, this is telling us there's, we can do better. There, there would be additional statistical approaches. But part of the reason this is, I think, a, an important problem is not just the improved prediction because really we are tinkering in the margins we we mostly capture whatever heritability there is to be captured it's you know it's you always want to do the best you can um, but it may be that if we could learn to do this better it would inform us about why it is and how it is that some genes have these distantly acting enhancers and have um, have quite different patterns of their genetic regulation in some tissues than in others. And that's a fundamentally interesting and important question. And so the point to spending some time trying to improve the predictions is to see whether even from purely improved statistical performance, we could learn something or vice versa. We could use approaches where we would try to learn from the data intrinsic factors that might have to do with evolutionary history or some patterning on what genes with distantly enact, acting enhancers um, that affect their expression in a single tissue, how they're different from other genes. So I think it's an example of something where you have a, a small or local problem that has potential impact on other things. And so the, my second story is to try to interest you in pleiotropy. So for those of you who don't know, pleiotropy is, has been described as, as when one gene influences two or more seemingly unrelated phenotypic traits. And I love this definition because there's a lot of genetics jargon that has incorporated our ignorance. The, this word seemingly <laughs> is basically acknowledging you know, our ignorance about how things work. So if we didn't know that LDL cholesterol, high LDL levels caused, you know, as a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and myocardial infarction, we might have called seeing genetic variation at the LDL receptor being associated with both LDL levels and myocardial infarction, pleiotropy. But because we know that's a causal pathway, we don't call it pleiotropy. So the seemingly actually matters. There are a lot of examples of things that 
were thought of as pleiotropic until they were understood better. And it's sort of silly to make those kinds of distinctions, um, but, but there you have it. Um, and it's not an uncommon thing in genetics to uh, try to quantify or otherwise describe our ignorance about things. So I'm going to tell a quick story about fishing for pleiotropy. Um, and just to remind you, Peter, as Peter Vischer noted in his talk, pleiotropy is ubiquitous. Think of Mendelian diseases. So Lisa described some. Cystic fibrosis, for example. You have all these features in the lung. Those are often what um, would have led to the early death of children with cystic fibrosis. But you can, have, you can develop diabetes because of cystic fibrosis because just in the same way the lungs get all gunked up, the pancreas gets all gunked up and you get pancreatic insufficiency. Um, so you actually lose the ability to secrete a lot of the hormones the pancreas usually secretes. Not just insulin, but a bunch of the other uh, hormones that are secreted from alpha and delta cells as well. Male infertility also, she noted that that was one of the symptoms. If you didn't know what that chloride channel did, that's a mystifying set of phenotypes, right? Like lung, pancreas, diabetes, male infertility, how did that all fit together? But when you know that it's a chloride channel, it sort of makes perfect sense how the failure of this leads to altered, um, you know, really al altered amounts of water and, and salt that are getting in and out of cells. So it's ubiquitous in Mendelian diseases. Lots of Mendelian diseases affect multiple organs or multiple biological systems, and we don't think a thing about it. Um, but in the context of common variation, um, people seem to be continually surprised and distressed about the pleiotropy. I think of it as a good thing. Um, so they came to us um, and wanted to know from the biobank what these two genes did. And you know, so they wanted to know what phenome was associated to the reduced predicted expression of this gene, because in the zebrafish core, they had, um, after an ENU mutagenesis experiment, mapped um, loss of function mutations in the RIC1 gene to what they called in the zebrafish a craniofacial anomaly. So the zebrafish didn't have nicely rounded heads. They had kind of cut off heads. And, and they wanted to know what else to look at. So they, the mechanism and why they wanted to look at the two genes is that the, these genes move the big fibrillar collagens out of the endoplasmic reticulum, so out of the cells, to do their jobs in the periphery. Those, uh, the big fibrillar collagens are too big to move through the ER in the normal way to be excreted from cells. So this, the, these two genes act like a little protein machine that just sort of rolls the fibrillar collagens up like uh, the old film cassettes and then just rolls that cassette right out the endoplasmic reticulum. And it, it's a two, pro, two gene, two protein machine. And so, and it turned out when we looked it up, the phenotypes for both genes were quite similar despite the fact they're on completely different chromosomes and unrelated to each other, we see some bone um, and fracture phenotypes, but a lot of connective tissue disorders, a lot of different ways of saying connective tissue disorder from just connective tissue disorder to diseases of the synovian bursum, bursa to um, th things that turn out to be very related to connective tissue disorder um, and, and bone and, and tooth formation. So tooth development and eruption um, was another set of phenotypes. We saw gait disorders, and I'm going to say that turns out to be related to the connective tissue stuff. You see asthma, um, that's related to the roles probably that the collagens play in, in, in the extracellular matrix um, in lung. We saw a bunch of esophageal gut and digestive disorders, so malabsorb malabsorption syndromes and vitamin and mineral deficiencies that I'll come back to, strabismus and amblyopia. Um, were both associated. And then um, pervasive developmental delay and um, ADHD were associated in the first 10,000 subjects. But it, as the sample sizes increase, many other neuropsychiatric 
um, disorders are associated also. And the fish, when they went back and looked, um, have all of the, the things where you see a fish and the very small fish by the neurological and psychiatric disorders is that we can't, we don't really know what pervasive developmental delay and ADHD looks like in a fish, but, but they can look at the brains. And I'm going to show you quickly some of the um, differences in brain morphology. So the results of the BioView studies directly prompted um, a set of studies. So first looking at the teeth and um, in the wild type versus the mutants, are, if the, the teeth are much more well developed in the wild type than in the mutants. And from a different view, you also see the same sort of difference between the wild type and the mutant. So much less well developed um, tooth structures. They also did muscle attachment studies. So I want to draw your attention to um, this part of the slide first. Um, so part of what the fibrillar collagens do is cross-link muscle fibers to the things they're supposed to attach to to do their jobs. And so this, this would be the idea in a wild type, you've got all this cross-linking present. And so the muscle fibers are nice and stretched out between the two things, the two, you know, whether it's a, a bone and tendon, whatever it is, they're, they're stretched out nicely and well attached um, to those surfaces. But in mutants where we fail to have the fibrillar collagens deposited in the right way, um, we're missing that. And then the muscle fibers just fold back on each other. So when we look um, at both small muscles in the eyes and then at the larger muscles on, along the sides that help the fish swim, um, we see in the wild type really nicely stretched out um, appropriate muscles. Um, but in the, in the mutants, God, I can't get the cursor to show up. Well. It, it, yeah, here, here we go. Um, they're not as stretched, and these bright spots are where the muscles have folded up into those little balls instead of being stretched out um, as in the wild type. And you can see here as well, it's almost easier to see in the black and white. Um, you can see the contracted fibers. Yeah, here, oh, sorry. Here in the wild type animals, um, but retracted um, and very wavy, clearly not normal. Some, and then in some of the animals, you know, you, the, you, a lot of the muscle fibers just haven't attached and they're folded up and there are these bright spots. And we could show that in the small muscles around the eyes that control the movement and stability of, of eye movement, but then in the larger muscles. And so for things like amblyopia and strabismus, that makes sense as a mechanism and for even the gait disturbances um, for the larger muscles. And in the brain studies, they were able to see quite um, notable differences, <laughs> let's see, in both the forebrain and the cerebellum. So the sizes of both organs are quite different, um, shown here, but also the degree of connectivity. So the wild type is on top, and this um, box shows a part of the brain that then is blown up in this segment. And you can see um, in both the, uh, the larger vision, much less connectivity, um, fewer fibers um, connecting, and a, a really unusual um, lack of connectivity in the cerebellum uh, also between the two, the knockout versus the wild type. The animals, um, we think because of the muscle problem, don't swim very much, so they don't look like they have ADHD. Um, but they don't live long enough, enough for us to do really um, long-term behavioral experiments. And then we had the bad luck, we had the good luck, but families in Saudi Arabia had the bad luck to be characterized as having a syndrome 
caused by mutations in this same RIC1 gene. And originally, the kids were just described to have developmental delays, an intellectual disability, and some craniofacial anomalies and pediatric cataracts. So that was the entire description of the syndrome until we saw, an, and I called up my friend in Saudi Arabia who did the genetics work and said, we, we've got a zebrafish knockout and we've looked in the biobank and we see all these additional phenotypes and they were willing to use our BioView statistical associations across by then tens of thousands of subjects as a guided approach to reevaluating the patients. They went back and looked for the things that we had seen associated in our patients. And so while I said, I noted they, you know, they had, they were reported originally to have the intellectual disability and abnormal face shape, including microcephaly and cleft palate. Because of things that we discovered, they looked at the ear morphology, which was abnormal, the misalignment and abnorma or abnormality of dental eruption. They all had gait, disturb gait disturbances. Um, pediatric cataracts were, were part of the original report. The kid, many of the kids have asthma, sleep disturbance, and ADHD, which we all had seen associated. In addition, they didn't, all of the gut stuff, um, they didn't want to do any, you know, in, intensive GI studies on these kids. They had very severe ADHD. That so hard, it was very hard to do, um, to do the studies on the kids because of the severity of the ADHD. And, but they, the moms told us that the kids have six bowel movements a day and move whole foods through their digestive systems. Food goes very fast through the zebrafish gut also. <clears throat> and we think that's why you see the vitamin and mineral deficiencies and malabsorption syndromes. So here we have an example of the continuum from Mendelian disease where mutations at a single gene cause a whole series of phenotypes that are truly pleiotropic in a sense. You might not have put them together if you didn't know all the things, the different things that fibrillar collagens do, which I totally didn't at the beginning of this study. And it goes from loss of function to mutations like in the zebrafish to the deleterious amino acid substitutions that we see in the Mendelian patients to just reduced expression of the gene. The people with just reduced expression of the gene, they usually just have one of these phenotypes or maybe two of the phenotypes and not necessarily from birth, um, but, but some of them come later in life. Of course, the tooth eruptions and defects, that's, that's generally earlier in life. But the, the point is that this is something that we probably should expect always. And I don't even know whether to call this pleiotropic phenome anymore because I think there's a lot of good biological rationale for why we see the things that we see. So does it still pleiotropy, Ben? But it's easy to see why we should see connections between phenotypes and how we might then use this broader phenotype to try to discover more genes that act in this same space and may lead to the same phenotypes. So we used the phenome risk score concept but not with the original description of the Mendelian disease, which was pretty sparse, but rather with the description of the phenotypes that we saw in the biobank, in the zebrafish, and then upon re-examination in the kids with the Mendelian condition, created a phenome risk score and tried to use that to find more genes associated to this collective phenome. And so when we, run predict scan with this phenome risk score. Some of the top genes you pick up are fibrillar collagens, my Bart Simpson moment, and collagens known to regulate the expression of fibrillar collagens at, at um, more protein levels. So, and then there were some additional genes. This is FAM124A, um, but that have some really interesting biology. So FGD6, the Energy for the little protein machine is a GDP GTP coupled energy system, and this exchange is bound GDP for free GTP. And so they're actually looking in the zebrafish now at whether this or the zebrafish ortholog of this gene actually participates in this process. Um, Adam TSL4, 
attaches to fibrillin and fibrillar collagens in extracellular matrix to cross-lengthen and strengthen it. Um, so very similar to the fibrillar collagens in part of its function. Uh, ADAM2 does the endoplasmic reticulum associated degradation of large misfolded glycoproteins. So if you don't keep the ER clog free, none of the big uh, proteins can get out. And so um, another way to, to end up in the same kind of phenotypic space. And as the fi other fibrillar collagens and ADAM TSL4 are all Mendelian matrisome proteins, just like RIC1 and RGP1, um, we looked, and indeed, Mendelian matrisome genes are hugely overrepresented among top signals from this analysis. So then we said, okay, we could do this with something that was both a Mendelian gene and a gene where the expression was showing association to relevant phenome. Could we do it for something that looks Mendelian but where no genes have been discovered yet? So Vactoral is a... Uh, uh, syndrome with multiple congenital anomalies. You have to have at least three of several congenital anomalies. And some colleagues at Johns Hopkins are sequencing a bunch of patients with Vactoral um, to look for mutations in genes that might be associated. The suspicion is it would often be uh, de novo mutations but because there are multiple congenital anomalies. But, um, but so they're doing that sequencing and we want to see if we could help by finding genes whose expression is associated to the phenome risk score for Vactoral. And there's some really interesting genes. Um, so there's a couple of genes that um, have already been implicated in postnatal lethality, which is a great surrogate for something like Vactoral because most fetuses with multiple congenital anomalies are going to be lost before birth. Um, and so seeing a couple of these genes already be recognized for recurrent pregnancy loss or um, early pregnancy loss um, is a really interesting thing. Um, we also see other Mendelian disease genes uh, towards the top of the list. Um, Mendelian genes that are also associated with multiple congenital anomalies. And in a kind of, kind of creepy um, gene by environment, one of the top genes is the receptor for, for Toxoplasma gondii infection, which is an infection known to cause uh, pregnancy loss. So it's a, you, um, you can catch it from cats. Uh, and if you're pregnant, when you get it, um, it can be associated with pregnancy loss or with congenital anomalies. So uh, another sort of interesting early gene. But could, then we said, okay, could we do this for truly complex diseases? Um, I promise I'm almost done. Um, and a key thing to remember as you think about this is no, no gene exists to cause disease. Genes don't, they don't exist to cause disease. They have their everyday jobs. And when they fail on their way to causing or contributing to the development of a really late onset disease like Alzheimer's, for example, where we lose many people to other things, they die of other things before they ever get Alzheimer's because it's so late onset, they're emitting signals in the EHR that is pleiotropic phenome related to that genetic variation. Um, and if we can learn to find, recognize, and use that, we have much bigger targets for discovery. And so this is uh, work from Shui Zhang, who's a, a young faculty member at Vanderbilt. Here's the predict scan associations of presenilin 1, one of the Mendelian causes of Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's. And uh, there's no Alzheimer's here. Um, osteomyelitis and fractures, um, multiple fractures, um, and you see bacterial enteritis and C. diff infections, even some congenital anomalies of the limb, all phenome-wide significance in an analysis. Presenilin 1, as I said, is a Mendelian cause of early onset Alzheimer's. But one of the genes characterized later, where common variants are associated with the regulation of the gene, were discovered in GWAS for Alzheimer's. 
and rare variants um, in Alzheimer's sequencing studies have been found also to be contributory. Um, some recent papers on this. TREM2, the phenome, looks kind of similar, right? So you got the chronic osteomyelitis, cerebral lacerations, um, at, the ones you can't see include diverticulosis and hallucinations. Now TREM2 is also a Mendelian gene, rare recessive um, alleles, uh, so you have to be homozygous, um, lead to a syndrome of myelination defects, so the myelins surrounding the axon sheaths of neurons, uh, that myelin is, is inappropriate. Um, doesn't conduct signal as well, doesn't protect the axons and neurons as well as it should, leads to a kind of uh, um, degeneration syndrome. But also the patients have fractures and osteomyelitis. They develop bone cysts. So that in this rare Mendelian condition, you have both the effects in neurons and osteoclasts um, that, that never form properly, turn over too rapidly, um, and die off, leading to the bone cysts, fragile bones, and, and a great medium for the growth of bacteria in the bones. These are not the only Alzheimer's genes where our phenome in BioView is osteomyelitis and fracture, and even the C. diff comes up with multiple of the genes. And it's not because you get old and then you get brittle bones and, and you get Alzheimer's. Osteomyelitis here is diagnosed on average 20 to 25 years before the Alzheimer's diagnosis. And in our biobank, using the whole two point some million patients on whom we have data, if we look at the, a diagnosis of osteomyelitis between age 50 and 60, those people have a six-fold increased risk for develop, uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's above age 70. So we think that we can create um, Alzheimer's uh, phenome using the first 30,000 patients, pleiotropic phenome, create a phenome risk score in this case, weighted by the significance of the association to just the small number of known genes today for Alzheimer's. I can't remember if it's eight or 11, but it's a small number robustly and certainly associated with Alzheimer's at the gene level. And then in the next 90,000 patients, try to identify additional um, Alzheimer's. And I think developing methods to discover and perhaps more importantly to use pleiotropy is really important because it gives us a much bigger target for discovery. Uh, George Davy Smith has a really nice paper in BioArchive showing the improvement in power for Mendelian randomization studies if you include pleiotropic phenome. You just have much bigger targets. It matters for clinical utility as well. There's all kinds of new style drug trials, adaptive trials, where you can modify the design uh, midstream, pragmatic trials that are done in real world clinical settings, not by physician scientists, but by everyday physicians. And then in silico trials. Um, and here, what I'd want to do is use the EHR to try to understand whether you'd get the same results with the, just the dementia phenotypes as with the full pleiotropic effects because we'd do so much better in clinical trials if we could do that. So that, that's it. These are the people who I didn't already um, acknowledge um, for all of their contributions and our funders. I'm sorry I ran over.